Okay, well, you can turn to chapter 18. I've been wanting to teach on assurance at the Wednesday night study, and I figured I'd lean on the confession, and when we come to that chapter on Sunday morning, we'll skip it because we've already done it, or we could do it again for that particular group. So chapter 18 of the grace, or of the assurance of grace and salvation. Now there's an actual book of the Bible that is pretty well devoted to this theme. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the apostle write, uh, writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. The apostle not only wants us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but to have that assurance. If we're not sure or we don't have assurance, then it's going to mobilize, uh, immobilize us from Christian responsibility, from functioning in a manner that is consistent with the entirety of God's Word. Spurgeon preached a sermon on that particular text, and he made this observation. He says, many who believe on the name of Jesus are not sure that they have eternal life. They only hope so. Occasionally they have assurance, but the joy is not abiding. They are like a minister I have heard of, who said he felt assured of his salvation, quote, except when the wind was in the east. It is a wretched thing to be so subject to circumstances as many are. What is true when the wind is in the soft south or the reviving west is equally true when the wind is neither good for man nor beast. John would not have our assurance vary with the weather glass, nor turn with the vein. He says, these things I have written unto you, that ye may know that you have eternal life. He would have us certain that we are partakers of the new life, and so know it as to reap the golden fruit of such knowledge, and be filled with joy and peace through believing. So there's obviously two extremes in terms of assurance that I think this chapter is calculated to address. First, the possession of it by those who shouldn't have it but as well the absence of it by those who should have it. And oftentimes we find ourselves amongst that latter category, those who should have it but do not. So let's read chapter 18, the, the several paragraphs there, and then look at it in some detail. So paragraph one, although temporary believers and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and in a state of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish? Yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. This certainty is not a bare conjectural, uh, conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel, and also upon the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit unto which promises are made, and on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God, and as a fruit thereof, keeping the heart both humble and holy." This infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of means, attain thereunto. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted as by negligence and preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which woundeth the conscience and grieveth the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance, and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet are they never destitute of the seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, 
and by the which, in the meantime, they are preserved from utter despair. Amen. Well, oftentimes, someone will ask the question, how do I know that I am saved? Well, typically, I would direct them to the cross. I would ask them specifically, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That oftentimes then evokes a second question, well, what about my feelings? I don't always feel like I'm saved. My typical response is, forget about your feelings. We just sang, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Now, I'm not denying there's feelings and emotions in the religious life, but I am suggesting that to rely on feelings and emotions in the religious life is a fool's errand. That's not going to serve you well. And as we move through this particular chapter in our Confession of Faith, largely based on Westminster Confession of Faith, and Savoy Declaration, we see that emphasis on the objective ground, namely the blood and righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then the subjective evidences. We might say it's Christ's work for us in the gospel, and then the Spirit's work in us in terms of sanctification. So as we look at this chapter, it outlines pretty, quick, uh, pretty simply. First, we see the possibility of assurance in paragraph one. Secondly, the foundation of assur assurance in paragraph two. The attainment of assurance in paragraph three. And then finally, the difficulties associated with assurance in paragraph four. You ought to appreciate the biblical realism of the authors of these confessions of faith. They underscore the reality that not everything is always, you know, uh, peaches and cream and roses and, and bluebirds attending our way to the celestial city. They underscore or understand that there are difficulties in the Christian life. There are seasons wherein we may doubt our place before God. And so they address that head on. And I think they give good biblical counsel in terms of how to approach this particular question. So let's look first at the possibility of assurance in paragraph one. Notice it, the, the qualification. It starts off with a qualification. Although temporary believers and un, other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and in a state of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish. Now, when it refers to temporary believers, we oftentimes see that in scripture. You see a temporary faith. You see sometimes what's called a historical faith. The truth of saving faith may be absent, well, is absent in the part of these who have some sort of a temporary belief in Jesus. In fact, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 6, which is an apostasy passage, and it underscores what these temporary believers at times possess. Notice in Hebrews chapter 6, specifically at verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. I don't take that as an Ephesians 1.13 partaker of the Spirit. I do not believe these are saved people who have been sealed and guaranteed by the Spirit. But they've been in churches. They've seen the effects of the Spirit at work. They've participated or partaken of that. They've seen good and glo glorious things in the context of the church. These are not saved people. They weren't saved and then lost their salvation. They were never saved. So again, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So in terms of temporary believers, there are some things that they have seen, some things that they have learned, and yet it has never taken hold in their hearts. So they may have these false hopes. They may have these carnal presumptions. But as well, it says, and other unregenerate men take false religions. Typically, people in false religions are in that religion because they think it provides for them something good in the afterlife. So you have people like you know, Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus. They think all, the, all is well. As long as you're in their religion, as long as you're doing your thing, then everything's going to go well for you in that age to come. So the confession highlights that there is a class of people that delude themselves, that are hypocritical. They are living on a false hope. So that said, then it goes on to say that there is such a thing as true assurance. 
Notice, yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus. Again, it starts with that objective basis. The first order of business to examine whether or not you are saved is what think ye of Christ? Do you confess him as the son of the living God? Do you confess him as the one who lived and died and was raised again? So it says, yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity. Remember that, that love is a consequence of true saving faith. I think that's the emphasis by Paul in Galatians chapter 5. I don't think Galatians 5, 6 is a papist statement where it teaches that faith and love work together to bring about salvation. I think 5, 6 indicates that faith is, or God, uh, we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, and then the consequence or effect of that faith is love. So for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul pronounces anathema on those who do not love the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. And then we closed out the book of Ephesians in the last few weeks. Notice in Ephesians chapter 6, same sort of an emphasis there. In verse 23, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Well, who loves Jesus Christ in sincerity? It is those justified freely by his grace. So the qualification, there is a case or a class rather of men that delude themselves that all is well with them and they're heaven bound. Then now dispensing with those persons, it does tell us that yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity. And then again, more consequences of that. We believe the gospel. We love Jesus sincerely. There is that endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him. Now, brethren, it's not perfect. There's struggles, there's hardships, we're prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love. I think at times we project upon the scripture and upon ourselves that it's calling us to perfection. And if we're not perfect, therefore we must not be saved. No, we are endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him. That's the particular emphasis. And then it says, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. So with reference to assurance, notice the benefits here. It's not only stated, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace, but it brings that joy in the hope of the glory of God. There really is a difference between those persons who have this understanding that I am Christ's and Christ is mine. There is a joy consistent with that understanding versus the person that's not sure, the person that's always struggling, the person that's always in sort of a state of limbo. That person's heart is not flooded with joy. If you've met that person, you know that that heart is not flooded with joy. And then it says that hope shall never make them ashamed. And I love the statement the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You can turn there, 2 Timothy chapter 1. When he says, and again, it's grounded upon the reality of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So the possibility of assurance is a biblical reality. Again, 1 John 5, 13. I write so that you may know. If it wasn't a possibility, John wouldn't write so that you may know. John's gospel, it's about targeting unbelievers and, and believers. It's instruction for believers. But in John 20, 30 and 31, these signs are given so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that believing in his name, you may have everlasting life. So belief in him for justification. And then 1 John 5, 13, continue to believe in him so that you may know, so that you may have this assurance, so that you may have this joy and you may live without shame. Now notice in the second paragraph, the foundation of assurance. Again, it begins with the objective ground. 
So ver uh, the beginning in paragraph two, this certainty is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope. Again, the idea here is stressing the authority, the infallibility, and the inerrancy of God's word. So it says, this certainty is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. So when the confession comes to deal with the ground of our assurance, it goes first to the cross. It is the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ revealed in the gospel, that true, infallible, and certain word of God that does not lie. It comes from him who cannot lie, and therefore its propositions are to be received by faith. Believing those things to be true, we can have this assurance. Believing these things to be true, we can have this joy. Now, as the divines write these paragraphs and these chapters, they typically have heretics or false teachers in view. And specifically, I would suggest that Roman Catholicism and Arminianism would be two of those particular contraries. For Roman Catholics, Robert Shaw makes the, uh, makes the observation. He says, the Church of Rome deny that it is possible for any man in this life to attain more than a conjectural and probable persuasion of salvation, except by extraordinary revelation. Again, you'll see some of these concepts brought out. They are contrary to what the Romish, Romish Church teaches. He says, and they build some of the most gainful part of their traffic upon that perpetual doubt and uncertainty. You have to appreciate that. The seven sacraments in the church of Rome and the various means that are, that are given to, to bring assurance to you are also calculated to bring money into the church and to bring devotion and lifelong devotion to the church. And so he goes on to say, with, uh, in which... Uh, they keep their votaries in which they profess in some degree to remove by the prayers of the church the merits of saints and martyrs and the absolution which the priests pronounce in the name of God. And if you doubt this, not, this isn't just a Presbyterian commentary on the Westminster Confession. The sixth session of, the cha of chapter 9 of the Council of Trent condemns assurance. It's called against the vain confidence of heretics. And I would suggest that a lot of it has to do with a faulty understanding of the gospel. If they don't see, see Christ's blood and righteousness alone as their hope for acceptance with God most high, if they see that as part plus their faith, plus their works, plus their, 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 their duty to the church, well, of course they're not going to have assurance. Of course it's going to be absence. There's no Romans 8.1 in a Roman Catholic heart. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have that because faith in Christ plus your particular efforts. But as well, com consider Arminians. In consistency with their denial, Shaw again, of the certainty of the saints' final perseverance, they hold that it is not possible for any man to attain a greater certainty of salvation than this, that if he shall persevere in the faith to the end, he shall be saved. So again, it places the onus or the, 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 the uh, responsibility ultimately upon him. So if you have a faulty view of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're probably going to have big struggles when it comes to assurance. So again, back to that first question, how do I know I'm saved? The specific response is, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's where it always must begin. And so then the confession, again, highlights that. Founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. So that's the particular emphasis. Notice the importance of this statement should be obvious. What the Spirit does internally, the subjective sorts of evidences that follow, all flow from this objective ground of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know that I can make this simpler. This is exactly what is lacking at times in the hearts of those who struggle with assurance. They're not looking at the cross. They're looking at themselves looking at the cross. 
They're looking at the devil. They're looking at former churches. They're looking at bad doctrine. They're looking at feelings. They're looking at emotions. When you get a view of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and you have genuine faith and faith even of a mustard seed, We'll notice later that there, or or we notice in in chapter 14 when it talks about faith, there's weak faith. But as Machen says, weak faith will not move mountains, but there is one thing that weak faith will do. It'll bring a sinner's conscience into peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is the foundational place, the objectivity of the cross. Again, moat, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Now, then it continues in paragraph two to go to those inward evidences of those graces of the Spirit. So in other words, look to Christ. If you're looking to Christ, then there's going to be, and again, it's going to be in different degrees. Not everybody has the red hot sort of zealous approach to Christianity as did the Apostle Paul. You're not Paul. And praise God, you don't have to be Paul. That's pernicious teaching, I have found, when you hold up a particular man and tell everybody else they need to be just like that man. That is detrimental to the hearts of God's people. That is never done. Oh, well, Paul does it. Imitate me as I imitate Christ in sort of different contexts. But the the emphasis in Scripture is to look unto the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Now, we can learn good examples from godly men. But when we make a man or men the paradigm for what conversion looks like, we are not being biblical with people. We are being... I don't know what it is. It's just weirdness and things we ought not to do. So notice, after this look to Christ, the blood and righteousness of Christ, and also upon the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit unto which promises are made. What are the graces of the Spirit that I think is coming forth here? Turn to the book of of, uh, 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 Ephesians. You might already be there. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, one of the graces of the Spirit is faith in Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. See, these things work together. The subjective is working consistently with the objective. The objective is the emphasis. The subjective is consequential. But the subjective works in concert with that objective reality, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1. Of course, this is going to bring a whole lot of other questions. Well, how do I know my faith is saving faith and it's not temporary faith and it's not uh, historical faith? Well, again, these other elements involved in this particular chapter and with what Scripture says. Look at Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. So the grace of the Spirit operative in the hearts of men is faith but also repentance. Now, repentance, brethren, as I've often tried to explain, is a change of mind. There are fruits associated with that change of mind, but it first is a change of mind. There are people out there that stop smoking crack. There are people out there that stop looking at internet porn. There are people out there that stop engaging in destructive behavior, but that's not necessarily repentance. Repentance is the flip side of the coin with reference to faith. It's believing repentance. It's repentant faith. Those things go hand in hand. Their grace is given by the Spirit of God. This is our conversion. This is our response to the Lord Jesus as he's offered in the gospel. So repentance is a gift. Notice Acts 5.31. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 11, Peter's report concerning the conversion of Cornelius and his household. After he rehearses that in chapter 11, verses 2 to 11, 
Notice what it says in verse 18. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And then 2 Timothy 2 verse 25. Yeah. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Now again, repentance isn't perfect. Your mind is changed by God's grace when you come to the Savior. But again, not 100%, not until heaven. So in this life, it will be imperfect. In this life, there will be struggles. In this life, there will be remaining corruption. But if there is that appreciation of the cross and its benefits, if there is a, an understanding of who Jesus is and a belief in Jesus, and then that belief does flow in terms of some outward evidences, those are good encouragements for the people of God. So not only faith and repentance, but also good works. Now I'm not suggesting that one, uh, uh, that good works by itself is somehow an evidence of one's conversion. Again, pagans do good things. They go out and, you know, alleviate the, the or ameliorate the downtrodden and the poor. They, they do some wonderful things. But in light of somebody looking to cro uh, Christ and his cross, in light of the fact that they have a faith in Jesus that they didn't have before, in light of the fact that they've had a change of mind about sin and Christ, they, they now want to serve him, they now love him, they don't love him as they ought, but they love him like they never did before, and there is this desire to stop engaging in particular sins. In that context, good works are a blessed benefit or a blessed evidence. I think that's the emphasis that John takes up in 1 John, John talks about those who do righteousness, those who obey God, those who love the truth. Those are the sorts of things, again, not in and of themselves that confirm a man or a woman is born again, but along with these other things are blessed fruits and, and lively evidences to assist us and to help us. So this idea of good works, Ephesians 2, once again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, how do we know that? Because the very works that we do are because of God, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then Philippians 2, similar emphasis in verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So in terms of these graces of the Spirit, we ought to appreciate that these graces of the Spirit don't go to the pagans. They don't go to the heathen. The graces of the Spirit are with those who by God's grace are looking to the objective ground for salvation in Jesus Christ, the one who lived, the one who died, and the one who was raised again. And then the confession continues. So we've got those graces of the Spirit unto which promises are made. And then this last bit, and on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God, and as a fruit thereof, keeping the heart both humble and holy. Now, admittedly, this is the most difficult to get your mind wrapped around. You know, what does this feel like? <laughs> what does this look like? How does this happen? You know, it, it, it seems quite mystical and quite mysterious, this testimony of the spirit of adoption. We'll look at the concrete teaching of God's word. I, I think, you know, whatever it means, we got to get our minds wrapped around the scripture. Notice in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, specifically at verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And then Galatians 4, a passage that has gotten a lot of, a lot of traction in our studies in the doctrine of the Trinity, Galatians 4, 4 to 6, we see the temporal missions of the Son and the Spirit. 
And in 4.4, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, in, uh, the spirit of his, his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And then I think Paul, or John rather, in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, this mysterious work of the Holy Spirit. What do we make of this? 1 John chapter 3, specifically at verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And then over in 4.13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. Now, again, I don't have the corner on this. I didn't read Owen or Turretin or any of these guys on this particular sort of a subject. But I, I, I think that when we, we're looking for this inward testimony of the Spirit, it's most likely not going to be a feeling. It's most likely not going to be an emotion. And it's definitely not going to be contrary to the Word of God. So the Spirit... Oper operates within the hearts of God's people in conjunction with the Word of God. I would suggest that being in the Bible is probably one of the best helps in terms of assurance. Knowing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, emphasizing or, or, or studying and, and, and searching the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture will help in this regard. And again, if there was an audible voice, it would make it all so simple, wouldn't it? But that's not what we see in the Scripture. We see this work of the Spirit in the hearts of God's people, testifying with them that they are, in fact, children of the living and true God. And then notice, thirdly, the attainment of assurance. It says, this infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. This is a very important se uh, section in the confession. This, this says that, that assurance does not belong to the essence of faith. So what does that mean? That means that Faith in the gospel is not the same as faith that we are partakers of the gospel. You may have the former without the latter. The confession highlights that assurance does not belong to the essence of faith. Turn back to par uh, chapter 14 where it speaks realistically or biblically about scripture or about faith. Notice in paragraph 1 of chapter 14, the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means appointed of God. Notice it is increased and strengthened. Okay? When we first get saved, our faith isn't as strong as it's going to get. That's Pretty simple. And then notice in paragraph 3 in the same chapter, this faith, although it be different in degrees and may be weak or strong, yet it is in the least degree of it different in the kind or nature of it, as is all other saving grace from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. So it makes these distinctions about faith. It, it recognizes that not everybody's faith is as strong as everybody else's. So back to chapter 18, paragraph 3. This infallible assurance doth not so long so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be a partaker of it. So essentially, no pun intended, what this means is that somebody can be looking unto the Lord Jesus Christ and have struggles as to whether or not he's looking unto the Lord Jesus Christ. The confession acknowledges that. It doesn't disenfranchise you. It doesn't say, well, how dare you doubt? You cannot possibly be saved then. Nope, it's not of the essence of faith. There's a class of persons out there that are melancholic. Look at Asaph and the Psalter. That, that brother was a man of sorrows and, and acquainted with grief like his master. 
as well, persons get taught bad theology. And as a result of bad theology, it may take some time for that person to come to a place where they have assurance, where they can say, Christ is mine and I am Christ. But that doesn't mean they're not saved. The confession, I think, is being very sensitive here to the human psyche, to the human condition, to, uh, to, to, to biblical psychology. There's a lot of things that scramble up sinners. And to say, well, you know, you don't have assurance, so therefore you must not be saved. You cannot do that. You cannot disenfranchise people. You try to encourage them. You try to point them to the cross. You try to point them to the various things that are, that are external evidences of an internal faith. You try to love them and, and, and help them, but you don't disenfranchise them from the kingdom because this infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith. I think that's a very helpful additive or, or, or addition to this concept of, of assurance. So you may struggle, there may be doubts, but the goal is to get beyond the struggle and to get beyond the doubts. That's why about midway through the paragraph, it says, therefore, it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure. In other words, don't put your head on the pillow until you get this settled. Why? Because you're going to be rendered ineffective. If you're constantly wondering whether you're saved or not, you're not going to be living like a saved person with joy and earnestness and a desire to go out and conquer the nations for King Jesus Christ. So the idea being is that you work through these things instead of just being blown about and just wondering and kind of thinking, no, settle it, come to scripture, learn who Jesus is, learn what the cross is about, learn what Paul means in, in Romans 8, 1, and settle it, deal with it. And don't look to your emotions, don't look to your feelings, don't look to those things that are built like roller coasters. Look to the objective ground of salvation. When you believe the gospel, you're saved. The consequence of that is then an assurance of that salvation so that you can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the confession underscores that it does not belong to the essence of faith and then says, but a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be a partaker of it. Now, brethren, this is kind of written in almost an exception way, isn't it? It's kind of like the normal course of things is that persons are going to believe the gospel. And in the normal course of things, persons believing the gospel are going to have that inward testimony of the Spirit that they are believing the gospel, that they by grace have repented from their sins, that there are some good works that are consequential to that belief in the gospel. That, that's the ordinary course of events in terms of one's appropriation of the gospel and its benefits. So the very beginning of paragraph three sort of starts off like an exception. There are those out there. But when you have whole churches filled with those, you've got to at least ask the question, is the preaching working in such a way to promote exceptions to the rule? And if it is, then there ought to be repentance at the pulpit level so that the freeness and the goodness and the graciousness of God's glorious gospel is proclaimed. If you are inculcating people that can never, ever, with any degree of assurance, lay hold of Christ and his benefits, then the problem may not be with the people. The problem may be with the pulpit. And men need to examine that. I remember very well one man by the name of William Hughes. He's gone to be with the Lord. He was preaching a series on the atonement. And he made this observation to Calvinistic Reformed Baptist pastors. If you're never accused of Arminianism when you preach the freeness of the gospel, then you're not preaching it properly. Now, that can be abused, that can be misused, I get that. But if you are constantly qualifying the cross, if you are constantly putting guardrails around the cross, you're not preaching the cross. If you would have stood over John's shoulder and said, well, I'm not sure I'd say God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm not sure that we can say God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. If the entirety of a church is, is described by an exception, then there might be a problem in terms of the pulpit. So again, it's a case, it happens, but 
It doesn't happen 100% of the time. It's not supposed to happen 100% of the time. And then notice what it goes on to say. We've got this provision by, again, the Spirit, yet being enabled by the Spirit. So I think we get this idea of God that He really doesn't want us to be saved. And if we are saved, He really doesn't want us to be happy. And, 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 and if we really are saved, we, we've always got to be miserable, and we've always got to be down, and we've always got to be gloomy, because that is piety or holiness. Where do you get that in Scripture? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. If your Christianity, not once in a while, I know my dear wife would say, it looks like I've been eating lemons over the last couple of days. I've got a lot on my mind, lots going on. But my general disposition isn't like I just ate a lemon. If a church is filled with people that only ever look like they just bit into a lemon, something's wrong there, brethren. The, the, the glory of God's gospel is the salvation of sinners and joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's what Peter says. So look at what he said. Or look what the, con the confession says. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, Remember, Shaw says that's what the papists believe that they had to have, extraordinary revelation. Yes, Jim, you're really saved, said the voice out of heaven. You're not going to get that, brethren. The, the, the Westminster and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the Savoy and this next clause, in the right use of means, those other confessions say in a due use or a, a, a right use of the ordinary means. So again, it, it sort of encapsulates this idea. Without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of means, or ordinary means, we already saw those, chapter 14, paragraph 1, how is faith ordinarily wrought? Notice, ordinarily, not extraordinarily, but ordinarily it's wrought through the preaching of the Word. Belief in the truth of the Gospel. It's strengthened by baptism and Lord's Supper, the means of grace, the ordinary, normal things that God has given to bless His people in the context of His church so that they can grow in their understanding and assurance of their salvation. So without extraordinary revelation in the right use of means, may attain thereunto. And therefore, look at this again, it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. That last clause is there for those who say, well, if everybody thinks they're saved, if they've actually got assurance, then they're going to be presumptuous and, 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 and most surely they won't be saved. Yes, brethren, some are going to slip through the net. It's going to happen. But the answer to some slipping through the net isn't to completely get rid of the doctrine, <laughs> right? I've never understood that. Well, you know, some fake out there might actually think he's saved. Okay, so let's get rid of the doctrine of assurance. Let's then make everybody miserable because somebody out there may possibly deceive themselves. That, that's like somebody got, you know, in an accident while driving drunk. Let's get rid of all the cars. Let's get rid of all the alcohol. Somebody shoots somebody unlawfully. Let's get rid of all the guns. Brethren, Christians are supposed to be smarter than that, especially ministers, guys that preach the gospel. You're not supposed to see the exceptions and then obliterate the rule. So when it comes to this, look at the fruit. Again, more positive benefit. It is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen when you're struggling and you're not sure and you don't know. That's not the case. You don't have a heart enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit in love and thankfulness to God. You don't know whether to love him and thankful, uh, be thankful to him or, or to be mad at him because you don't know if you're saved. And in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, which are the proper fruits of this assurance. It's a most blessed and wonderful thing. 
And assurance does not promote licentiousness. It just doesn't. False professors engage in licentiousness. True assurance of true faith does not promote licentiousness. Well, you know, if you let them think they're actually believers, then they're going to go out and sin. That's not gospel logic. Genuine believers reason with the apostle. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. And then the last paragraph deals with the difficulties associated with, with assurance. There are troubles. There are difficulties. There are problems. The confession isn't lying. It's not a Pollyannish document. It's not saying, well, everything's going to be okay. It's always going to be great. No, true believers may have the assurance of their salvation. Divers' ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted. And here's some of the reasons why. One, as by negligence and preserving of it. If you're not using the means, guess what? Your assurance may wane. If you're not eating properly and going to the gym, guess what? Your health may wane. By falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, yep, that'll do it. Read David's Psalms, specifically Psalm 38, verses 3 to 5. When I kept silent about my sin, my, my bones groaned or my bones ached within me. There is this absolute effect from this special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit. Do you think the nine months of Bathsheba's gestation was a high point of spiritual life in David? No. No, it wasn't. So, so when we ask the question, well, what could it be as to why my assurance may be wavering? Well, have you gone into Bathsheba? Did you cover it up by murdering her husband, the virtuous Uriah? Because that'll do it. And that's what the confession highlights. So negligence and preserving of it, falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation. And then this last one's a bit of a tough one. By God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Why does God do that? I don't know. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. The fellow that wrote those lines struggled. He struggled bad, 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 suicidal at one time. John Newton, his friend, saved him. You know how he saved him? He said, Cooper, let's write a book of hymns. If you ever see the only hymns, that was uh, Newton and, and Cooper. Newton had a pastor's heart. He saw his brother struggling. He saw his brother despondent. He saw his brother sorrowful and, and melancholic. And so the way that he sought to rescue him was employ his services for the kingdom of Christ in the composition of hymns. So there is that God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. And yet look at how the confession ends. The, the, the thing that we need to appreciate is that a lack of assurance, as we see at the beginning of paragraph three, does not mean a lack of salvation. You may lose some assurance, but as a child of God, you don't lose salvation. You may struggle, <laughs> you may be despondent, you may be melancholic, you may be sorrowful, but to heaven you will finally get. Yet are they never destitute of the seed of God and life of faith. That love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are preserved from utter despair. There may be despair, but it won't be utter despair. And in that, we can greatly rejoice. Well, I doubt all your questions are answered, but I think that this is at least a place to come to search the texts that are indicated, the proof texts underneath the several paragraphs, wrestle with 1 John, wrestle with those passages concerning the internal testimony of the Spirit. But above all, look unto the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's the final analysis. Well, let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that there is a book devoted to us knowing that we have eternal life 
I pray for your blessing upon this church. I pray that there wouldn't be an imbalance, that the, the fullness of the grace of God in the gospel would be proclaimed, that sinners by grace would believe on it. They would find that joy of salvation and that they would find that growth in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would go with us now, watch over our church in this coming Lord's Day. Uh, bless this conference that is coming up next week. May it be a time where you are glorified, even Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless the men who will be traveling here to preach and, and speak the truth and love to the people of God. And may you bless our attempts to increase fellowship and, and, and camaraderie with other brothers in our community. And we pray through Christ the Lord. Amen. Well, any questions or comments on any of that? Remember, no Bible study next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday. I'll send out an email to remind everybody. But yeah, uh, no, no Bible study next Wednesday. Yes, sir. This next chapter is just the encouraging, right? I've been going through a couple of times. Yes. I was chapter that's not in the three forms, really. I think it's Calvin even believed that, well, I guess there's books and books have been written on this, right? Yes. But he believed that assurance is of the essence. Yes, yeah. Uh, I know I, I read Renahan's exposition today on the chapter. He leaned a lot on Beakey. So Beakey did his doctoral thesis on assurance, full assurance or something like that. And then he's got a couple of briefer works. But um, no, I, Renahan thought Beakey did, did well with it. So. <clears throat>